The Lord be with you. I trust some of you were saying that a few minutes ago. I uh, hope for me. Man. Tell you one, well, nothing. I sweat pretty easily, but, but wearing a black suit, being way too fat, and having to wrestle a three year old while trying to pray may be the quickest thing to bring on a sweat out of him. So that may be my new workout regimen. I may retire on that. So, uh, but anyway, let's uh, turn our hearts and minds to the Gospel of Matthew, the words of our Lord there in chapter 14, beginning with verse 13, reading through verse 21. <clears throat> now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. The hour's now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. May God bless the reading and hearing. Of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, o Christ, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, give us the strength to do what you would call us to do. Lord, help us to be the people you'd have us to be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. You know, I've probably read or heard this story in one form or another dozens of times. It's the only miracle performed by the Lord that is recorded in all four Gospels. Walking on water is not in all four. Turning water into wine is not in all four. None of that's done. Raising the dead, healing sick. The same stories are not in there. But this one is in all four. So it's hard to miss. It comes up every cycle in the lectionary. It comes up all the time in Bible school, Sunday school, all sorts of things. It's a story with which we are so familiar that we'll often make jokes in relation to this story. At least I do sometimes. Standing in line at the covered dish luncheon. Right? You look down the table. How much dressing is left in that pan? You start eyeballing who all's in front of you. You know so and so. He's going to eat the rest of it if I don't get there first. You start wondering. You look over at the dessert table. How many slices of lemon icebox pie are left? Then you look down the line. And you will. Don't act like you won't do it too. You start counting the number of folks. And there's four people in front of you and only two deviled eggs. And so you just sort of pray quietly or turn to the person in line behind you. Man, I sure hope somebody blessed this real good so it'll stretch out like them loaves and fishes because I was hoping for a pile of dressing and at least half a dozen deviled eggs. We've read this story in vacation Bible school. We've heard it in Sunday school and worship. Probably read it in your own private prayer time. Likely seen more than one cinematic version of it. I'm always kind of impressed with the way they sort of bring it to life on screen. Never really think about it. But it wasn't until I reread Matthew's telling that something caught my attention. Something that made me look at the whole thing just a little bit differently. You see, it's actually something that's not in the passage itself. At least not in the translation of the passage I've read this morning. 
There's a remnant of it, a trace of it in verse 13, but we'll have to walk it back a bit to really know what it is. You see, in verse 13, it just simply says, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the town. Did you catch it? Did you notice what's not being said in the passage there? Now when Jesus heard this, But when the crowds heard it, what is it? What exactly did they hear? Did they hear about some new tax the Romans were passing? Was their favorite television show being canceled? What was going on? What was it? What was it that they heard? Well, if you just look up a few verses, I have to turn a page back and look up in my Bible. Maybe you do too. But if you just look up a few verses in chapter 14, you'll discover what it is. What what, what it was that, that Jesus and eventually the crowds heard was the news of John. John the baptizer. John the Baptist. His death at the hands of Herod. The Tetrarch flexing his muscle and chopping off the head of John the Baptist simply because a girl wanted him to do it. A sign of power. John's dead. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. Can you blame him? I remember... Just a few weeks ago, in fact, when I put this suit on this morning, it was in the pocket, the clergy record from my stepmother's funeral. I remember after the the graveside, my dad, everybody else was saying, oh, where are we going to go eat? What are we going to go do? Who gets the flowers? Who gets to go here? Who gets to do what? And my dad said, nobody come looking for me. I'm turning my cell phone off. I'm going into town. I got some stuff to do. Don't bother me. Don't come looking for me. I just need to get away. For a little bit. That's what Jesus does. He learns that his friend John, his mentor turned disciple, Luke says his cousin, Matthew tells us the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. This John has been brutally, senselessly murdered by one who wields the power of the empire. Not only is the shock of such news painful as it relates to Jesus' affection, perhaps, for John, but it's also news of the first real casualty of this whole Jesus movement, this whole kingdom of heaven thing that Jesus has been talking about. John's death brings into sharp focus the cost that comes with proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. John's execution no doubt brought home the weight of Christ's mission, the reality of its consequences, the realization of where this would all wind up for Jesus himself. News comes to Jesus. John is dead, and Jesus probably can't help but wonder, when is it going to be me? So it's no surprise to me, really, that when Jesus hears about John's death, he withdrew to a place that was otherwise deserted, to be left alone, to grieve, to reflect, to pray. But I suppose the crowds followed him when they heard the news because they wanted to see his reaction. To find out what was going to happen now. John's dead. Jesus, what are you going to do now? The first blow had seemingly been struck in this great cultural cosmic war some believed was imminent. And now, now we got to see what the leader's going to do. Rome struck first. Jesus, what are you going to do? How are we going to retaliate? Maybe. Or maybe there were some who wanted to know what to do now. It's getting real now, Jesus. All this talk was nice. It was nice healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. All that stuff was nice. But now somebody's dead. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Herod's willing to do whatever it takes to silence his enemies. Maybe the folks in the crowd were frightened, unsure of where this rabbi from Nazareth was leading them. But whatever it was, whatever it was at the heart of their actions, the Bible simply says when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. They left their homes 
and follow Jesus out into this deserted place. It's with all that weight, all that emotional, spiritual, anxiety-ridden weight that Jesus, the Bible says, went ashore, saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. If I'm honest with you, if it had been me, if it had been me on the boat getting off, I wouldn't have done it. Really, I'm afraid I would have just got back on the boat. I'd have got on the shore, seen all them folks, said, nope, not ready for it now, and rode back out into the middle of the lake and sat there until they all got the message and went home. Who wants a bunch of folks around them when they've got all that stuff on their mind? When they've got some real thinking to do, some honest grieving, spiritual wrestling to do. No, if it had been me, I might have had compassion for them, but I wouldn't have gone so far as to jump right back in there with them. Curing sick folks especially, because sick folks can be demanding. I just don't think I'd have done it that way. But as so often as he does in the Gospels, Jesus models for us the proper response. The kingdom response for those in need. Those who are sick, frightened, and hungry. And as they so often do in the Gospels, The disciples model our response, response too many of us have to those in need. You see, in verse 15, we read, when it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a deserted place. It's getting late. Send the crowns away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. In other words, it's getting late. We've been around these folks long enough. We're tired. There's nothing out here, no McDonald's, no Jack's. They had not opened a cook down here yet. Nothing here. Send them into town. Send them back home. Let them get a room at the Motel 6 down there. I don't care. Just send them away. We'll deal with them tomorrow. The disciples want the crowd to take care of themselves, to leave them alone for now. They've got their spiritual food. Go home. You got what you came for. Don't bother us anymore. They had been around long enough. They had their chance to get Jesus' autograph. Now it's time to go back to whatever it was they were doing. Go back home, or at least the nearest village, and fend for themselves. In that same deserted place, Matthew calls it, Jesus sees the opportunity to cure the sick. But the disciples only see the inconvenience of too many folks and too isolated a place. You know, I can't help but wonder how many times I've done the same thing. I can't help but wonder how many times I've thought of a situation as an annoyance or an inconvenience, as non-ideal, but Jesus, Jesus would have had me see it as an opportunity. I can't help but wonder how many times I've sighed with exasperation. This again? Groaned in aggravation. I'm tired of fooling with this person. All they do is complain or ignored something out of frustration. And there's Jesus. Jesus would have had me see it otherwise. See it as an opportunity for the reality of God's kingdom to break back into this world at least just a little bit. I'm telling you, I wonder how many times I've made excuses to God when God brought me to a place And all I look around, this is a deserted place. There's nothing here, nothing to do. But God has filled it with possibilities. I wonder how many times someone has been in need and God has equipped me to fill that need. Yet all I could think about was how that person ought to take care of themselves. I really can't help but wonder how many times those things have happened. How many times I've missed an opportunity to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And when I even look back on the ones I know I've missed, I can't help but wonder, why in the world God just doesn't give up on me? Why doesn't he just find somebody better suited for this stuff? I'm obviously not good at it. You might be, but I'm not. Why doesn't he just give up on me? Because the truth is, If it had been me, if I had been in Jesus' sandals when those disciples come telling me, shoot the crowds away, it's time for them to go on. We got a serious business to do, tell them to go on. If it had been me, folks, I might have lost it. 
I mean like turning over the tables lost it that Jesus does, right? I mean, remember, John's death is still fresh on his mind. John died. John died not an accident, not as a... He died because of his convictions about this movement that Jesus was heading, the kingdom of God. John had paid the ultimate sacrifice for even so much as being affiliated with Jesus and his movement. Yet here are Jesus' disciples. And what are they doing? Send these folks away. We don't want to feed them. They're annoying. It's getting late. John died, and they complained. If it had been me, friends, I'm telling you, I'd have fired them all on the spot. That's it. Sorry, getting a new batch. Don't start over. Y'all don't get it. I'd have given them some lengthy lecture on the cost of discipleship, how John has clearly paid the ultimate price, and here you all are bickering about stuff. But thanks be to God, Jesus is better than I am. Because he doesn't do that. Instead, he just simply, directly tells them, oh, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. They aren't going anywhere. It's your job to feed them. Boy, that's the last thing we want Jesus to say sometimes, isn't it? I mean, it's the absolute last thing. I mean, I'd rather get scalded, right? Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Me and you're going to talk later. No, no, no. They don't need to go away. You feed them. Lord, I, I wish you'd do something. Every time, every time I go to a Braves game, every time I drive to Atlanta, right there off the exit, there they are. Lord, I wish you'd do something about these homeless folks. Lord, I wish you would. And the Lord says, why don't you invite them home? That's not what I want. That's not what it's about, Jesus. Jesus, I, I sure wish you could do something about that old trashy trailer in the community. Maybe send the Holy Spirit there, convict them of their trashy ways, get them to pick up that garbage in the yard, get them old clunky cars out of there, get them dogs off the chain and out of the car. Yeah, Lord, I wish you'd send the Holy Spirit to convict them. And Jesus says, do you know their names? Do you know who they are? Maybe you should stop by. See if you can help them out. Oh, that ain't what it's about. God, God, I, I, I've, I've about had it with all these folks looking for a handout. They need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Get a job. That's what I do. The voice of God whispers in your ear. But what have you done to help them? The least of these, my family. The disciples see scarcity in a deserted place where Jesus sees the opportunity for healing. And here they see scarcity in a deserted place where Jesus sees the opportunity to show the abundance of God's kingdom. I mean, we know the rest of the story, right? Jesus says, you feed them. The disciples replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Now, John, it's the little boy, but in the others, it's the disciples. We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Have you ever noticed that? How they say it like that. It's like they're pessimistic from the get-go. This is all we got. Ain't nothing here. They're pessimistic about what they do have. Like they believe what they already have isn't enough. You can hear it in their words, can't you? It's the tendency so many of us have of wanting to hoard for ourselves, to hold back what we have because we're afraid that if somebody knows that we have it, they might want it. It's the same thing that I do whenever I'm walking on a sidewalk in some city and I know I might have a 20, a 10, and a 5 in my wallet and my little money clip part. And I pull that 5 out and leave it in my pocket because when I walk by, I want them to know I'm going to help you out, but I don't want you to see what else I got. It's the same thing. That's what they do. To hold back what we're afraid of, of, of other people wanting what we have. That they might actually need it. And that we might not get it back. It's the same thing we do. None of you do this, I'm sure. When the neighbor asks to borrow the weed eater. And there's the old one in the corner of the garage. You've got to run it on half choke. Uh, uh, mix the fuel a little richer. Leave it there. It runs for about 20 minutes and cuts off. And there's the one you bought last season. You keep it under the tarp. In the back, don't want them borrowing that one. Might not get it back. It's the same thing. 
You ever notice that? We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Now, now I'm sure, I'm sure that's not what they wanted to hear. Bring them to me? Why? What are you going to do with them, Jesus? What are you going to do with it? Now, hang on, hang on. You're not going to give it to them, are you? I mean, you're not going to give it to them. It's not our fault they didn't pack supper. It's not our fault they don't have enough. It's not our fault they're in the shape they're in. If they want to eat, let them work. Let them pack a peanut butter and jelly sandwich next time. Let them learn, Jesus. It's not fair. This is ours. Don't take it from us and give it to them. That's the lie of scarcity that causes us to react that way. We bought into this lie for years, centuries, really. But perhaps never more now than we do these days, ironically, in a time when we've never had more. It's not exactly like we can help it, though. It's not our fault. We don't mean anything by it. We've almost been programmed to believe there isn't enough to go around. That there isn't enough for everyone to have plenty. If it wasn't true, Sam's and Costco would be out of business. You wouldn't buy anything in bulk. We've been told to save, to hoard, to hide, to store up our treasures on this earth because there's always somebody out to get us, to bamboozle us, to take us for a ride, to take advantage of our kindness and Christian sensibilities. We've been trained, even as ministers, to be defensive, suspicious, overly cautious of every request for assistance, of every person on the side of Rhodes' life, of every sob story, And every person who comes around saying they're down on their luck. We run the imagined scenarios over and over in our heads, telling ourselves how it would be different if it was me. If it was me, I'd find a way to put food on the table. If it was me, I'd find a way to put a roof over my head that didn't leak and a floor under my feet that didn't give way. If it was me, it'd be different. Never once thinking about the disadvantages, societal, cultural, or otherwise, that others face. Or our own unnoticed privileges, societal, cultural, or otherwise. It's all part of the same lie. The same lie the disciples believed too. When they told Jesus, send the crowds away. And when they handed over their loaves and fish and said, we have nothing. It's the same lie. But Jesus demonstrates the truth of God's kingdom. The truth of God's abundance that reveals the lie of scarcity for what it is. In verse 19, Jesus orders the crowds to sit down on the grass. He takes the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. Did you notice that? I'll read it again. He gave them to the disciples, and the disciples... Gave them to the crowd. I've always overlooked that. Never really thought much about it. But Jesus doesn't bless the bread, break it, and then go himself. Y'all watch, this is how it's done. And go himself and hand it out. No, he gives it to the disciples who give it to the crowd. They have a role to play in all of this. We have a role to play in this inbreaking of God's abundant kingdom. I suppose, I suppose many Christians these days are under the impression that all we good Christian folks have to do is make some sort of statement of faith, maybe get baptized, maybe join a church, but otherwise keep your head down, keep your nose relatively clean, and wait until Jesus comes back and he'll fix everything. It seems a lot of folks who call themselves Christians these days are convinced that a life of faith is little more than a life of waiting. Where the most important thing you can do is argue with people who disagree with you until either they come around or somebody overhears you and they come around. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus breaks the bread of God's kingdom, the bread of abundance, the bread of plenty. The bread of there's enough for everybody and then some. The bread of justice, of righteousness, freedom, equality, faith, hope, and love. Jesus breaks this bread 
And then he gives it to us and says, give it away. Give it to the crown. Isn't that something? Jesus has given us the kingdom, the bread of life, and he's given it to us to share. Not to hoard it to ourselves, not to distribute it to those we deem suitable, not to, to hand it out as if it's a ration in short supply. I don't know. I don't know if I can trust you with this. We don't have much. That's not what he says. Not to greedily keep it as if by giving it away somehow diminishes its worth. No. In fact, the miraculous thing is, the more we give it away, the more there is. I think that's part of the miracle of the story. It's there. All ate and were filled. They took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. Those who ate were about 5,000 men. I apologize, they didn't count the women and children back then. But we can safely assume maybe another five, so 10,000 people. See, this isn't a story. This isn't just a story about the miraculous power of Jesus to magically manipulate matter, to make something out of nothing. This isn't a story that's meant to somehow prove the divinity of Jesus by this incredible act of, of dinnertime division. No. No, it's, it's more than that. It's a story about our obliviousness to opportunities placed in our paths by God. It's a story about how this world's lies about scarcity are overcome by the overwhelming abundance of God's kingdom. And perhaps above all else, it's a story about how Jesus still calls us and trusts us to be a part in sharing that abundance with everyone. How we are called to feed the hungry because there's more than enough food for all of us to have. How we're called to heal the sick because there's enough care and medicine to go around. How we're called to forgive because Lord knows there's enough pain, blame, hurt, and anger in this world. And God's forgiveness is way more than enough to cover it all. How we're called to love our neighbor, everybody as we love God and ourselves because there is certainty and eternity's worth of love that will forever outweigh the wickedness, the sinfulness, the hatred, the lust, the envy, the greed, and the selfishness that seeks to trap us all in the lie that there just isn't enough for everybody. This old familiar story to so many of us is a call to let go of that thinking that there isn't enough. To let go of that lie that there isn't enough to go around. That we have what is ours and everybody else, if they want it, they'll have to work to get it too. That we've got to keep our guard up or else we might be taken advantage of. That if we start giving stuff away, people might start taking it. That if we give it away, they'll take it all. They might even kill us. But friends, you know what I have to say to that? Do you know what, what this table says to that? What Jesus says to that when we say, but if we give it away, they might take it. They might take it all. They might leave us with nothing. Do you know what Jesus says to that? So? So what? They took it all from him. And he gave more anyway. So what? Let them take it. Get taken advantage of. If they do, if people do, keep giving it away. Because the truth is, the grand, wonderful truth of God's kingdom is this. There is always enough. There's always enough when you give away what God has given you. There's always enough at God's table. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord. 
when we give in to the lie of scarcity. Lord, when we believe the untruth that there isn't enough to go around. Help us, Lord, to believe in your greater truth that there is always enough. And that the more we give it away, the more there is. So God, as we come to this table now, as we are served the bread and the cup, may we be reminded of that miraculous act of feeding 5,000 and more from a few fishes and a few loaves. And may we be reminded of its truth that in the kingdom of God, there is always enough. Help us, Lord, to give away all that you give us, that you may forevermore give us even more. In your name we pray.